A very warm welcome to what is our sixth annual conference of Whole Education. I'm David Crossley. Um, I, I've helped develop the network at Whole Ed, and we're delighted that so many of you can join us today. Last year at this time, we sought our guidance and inspiration internationally, and we had, amongst other guests, two people who really both inspired and guided us and helped us look forward to the future. John Hattie surprised us in many ways by affirming his commitment to a whole education and the importance of passion and the moral purpose of why we came into the job. And Ron Berger, I think, challenges us all by demonstrating what young people can achieve if we expect the most of them. And we're also delighted to welcome back Linda and Judy, who I think can't leave us now. And, uh, and they've been working with us on our inquiry programme over the last year too. One of the things we hope our events do is build our own confidence. And this year, our focus is on the hows as much as the what, and how we can seize the agenda and make the most of the choices we have, even though at times things can, can seem quite challenging. I often use the image of an ostrich, and, um, and, and, the image, and one of the things faced by challenges we can do is hide our heads in the sand and hope it goes away. And, and I, I found a picture of an ostrich without its head in the sand, but looking rather wily, slightly subversive, and a little wise. And maybe that's an analogy of how we cope and respond to the challenges. So this year, our focus is on some of the hows of how we can move a system which, by any measures, what anybody, whatever anybody says is a good system, and how it can move to being a great one. To us, that revolves around the notion of an entitlement to a whole education. And that's a commitment not just to enabling young people to be as successful as they can be in an academic sense, but it's also about the wider skills too. It's interesting when we read reports from the Social Mobility Commission, amongst others, and they say so strongly and explicitly that the so-called soft skills leads to hard results. They are inseparable. They are part of the same whole. But often, because as a system we value those things less, we often end up putting less energy into them. And we certainly believe the only way to truly narrow the gap involves doing something more than just marginally improving test scores. Couldn't be more delighted than to have Tim hosting us for the day, bringing his insights and, and helping us steer a way forward and, and, in his words, find the gaps in the hedge to enable us to stay true to what we believe in, in a values-led education. And, and achieve those principles that brought us into the profession in the first place. So can you join me in welcoming Tim? <clears throat> I shall uh, explain what I mean by the gaps in the hedges in a minute, but, and I think they're absolutely vital, but before I do, you, quite a few in the audience will know me, and quite a few will see me and you'd all agree that I'm somebody who has a long history and a short future and uh, and one of the prices of that is that you can look back and somebody just asked me recently would I would I write a chapter of a book I don't know why they're writing the book I don't think anybody will read it but um, would I write a chapter on my involvement in policy as a result, policy making in education as a result of those years that I spent in it. And I said, well, of course, yeah, I'll do that. And then regretted it, as all of us in this room tend to do, namely say yes, and then afterwards think, oh my goodness, there's another obligation that I've taken on. Um, and uh, in doing so, I thought, well, I started school, which I did, just before VE Day. Um, so now you've placed me. And during that first period, there was a period, it seems to me, that lasts till 1968, and that will have shaped the futures of lots of people in this room one way or another, and it certainly shaped mine, which was an age of optimism and trust. The optimism was to do with it being a post-war period, and you remember all the things that happened um, in, the, in those immediate post-war years. And people really felt optimistic about education, so we needed more schools, we knew more education, colleges of further education in particular, it became that era that they were founded and people invested in them. And, and it, was an, it was an era where it was wonderful. And the only advice primary schools were given was in something called Story of a School, which was issued by the ministry as a pamphlet and was written by a head teacher. 
Uh, and incidentally, was clearly an advocate of whole education, if you ever read the booklet. And the, the interesting bit about the beginning of that is that the introduction was written by the minister who said, this is the story written by a professional whom we trust. And we trust you who read it to go out and do similar things and report what you learn and what you do. And that period, in that period, the Secretary of State had only three powers, the removal of air raid shelters, securing a sufficient supply of suitably qualified teachers and sharing out building programs in order that they, they all be roughly the same opportunities wherever you lived in the country. I think that era ends, though many of us didn't think it was ending, in nine, and that's one of the things about eras, because my argument is we're just ending another era. And it's having an eye as to what the new era is about. Uh, you know, I mean, you never know things are just going to happen. I'm sure if somebody had said in 1788 there's going to be a revolution in France in 1789, somebody, not many people would have believed them. When the Berlin Wall came down, nobody would have suggested that was possible 12 months before it happened. Anyway, round about 1968, with the benefit of hindsight, it, it all started to unravel, because in that year there was student unrest. The Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, invited all the Vice-Chancellors to see him. And we go through a period of doubt and disillusion. So trust and optimism is, optimism is replaced by doubt and disillusion. And you can see it in black papers, the William Tyndale affair, Rising Hill School, which even to this day, I dare say here, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson School, which was Rising Hill, uh, disguises the fact still today that it isn't Rising Hill because its address is off Fenton Street rather than in Rising Hill Street. Uh, so it's a, it's a really interesting period and it culminates for me the doubt and disillusion in Callaghan's Ruskin speech of 1976. And we knew then that politicians were going to get interested in the curriculum. The next era is identified by Mrs Thatcher's um, government because she became, she fell in love with liberal economic theory. And so what we have governing education increasingly, and incidentally, up to her time, there was only, only one act of parliament after 1944. Uh, it was the one that introduced special educational needs as the ineducable were not regarded as ineducable. And uh, since that time, there have been 45 acts of parliament affecting education. Uh, the Secretary of State, who had three powers, ha kind of now has over 2,000. Uh, but incidentally, when you know how ministers seek legacy, which none of us in this room actually welcome, because they always overturn everything we're up to. Uh, but I think that the legacy of M Michael Gove isn't the King James's Bible, isn't all the things that he's done. The legacy, unfortunately, will be him giving up the duty to secure a sufficient supply of suitably qualified teachers, because we're running into a period where it is going to be very, very difficult uh, to secure teachers. So you don't need reminding of all the difficulties. My third period, which I'm saying with Mrs Thatcher, was markets and managerialism. Why markets and managerialism? Markets because you believe in choice for parents, diversity of, institution, uh, of institutions, autonomy of schools, but you also believe in equity and equality. And of course, you can only secure equity and equality because markets produce failures as well as successes if you intervene with regulation. And in particular, one of the favoured things to do because it helps the market is to use Ofsted, which becomes more fiercely, and I would argue, more narrowly accountable of what we're up to, um, and that is the period we've lived through. I now think we're on the verge of a fourth age. And you can see the, uh, you can see the straws in the wind. When I took on the London Challenge in 2002 um, and argued with the then Labour government, that it was absolutely essential that they were going to give some money. Could I have some money for partnerships of schools? I was told no. Um, Tim, if you can persuade schools to cooperate, 
that would be great. But, you know, we've got scarce resource and we've got to put it into something that really matters. Now, as it happens, those partnerships did start to develop because we did persuade things. And certainly our first contributor today will be talking, I know, about how to make partnerships work because the whole of his career has been built on exploiting partnerships. Uh, to great advantage. So I think we're moving into a period of partnerships. Whether we're leaving a world of markets, I don't know. But we're definitely into a fourth age where partnerships are overriding autonomy of institution. So things are changing. I would argue one of the changes whole education should devote its time to is thinking about things such as, well, if we've got a fierce accountability system, shouldn't we have shouldn't we think of what we could do, whole education, ASCO, whole set of um, uh, people within uh, the system, what could we do voluntarily to say these things matter and whether you like it or not, we're going to publicly report on these matters. Uh, and that might be health, you can immediately think, you know, health is... Uh, you, it is measurable. You've got to think of metrics. It might be something to do with sets of experiences that all kids are going to have and what we offer and how that thing happens. So I, one of my challenges is that, and that brings me to Gaps in the Hedges. A year ago, I was invited to uh, the Institute of Education to give a keynote speech on a Saturday uh, celebrating the centenary of the birth of a man who died 25 years ago. And that was a man called Harry Ray, who many of you in this room will never have heard of. But Harry Ray was a very distinguished educator. He had a powerful effect on me. He was, a, he was a teacher before the war in grammar schools. During the war, he was going to be a pacifist, but he joined the SOE. And he did all sorts of amazing things during the war in SOE and starred in a film after the war and became a broadcaster, but gave all that up because he wanted to be a head. And he became the head of uh, Watford Grammar School. And he wrote a book called The Essential Grammar School. But because he cared so passionately about equity and equality, he realised, and give all of us of our age the benefit, please, of realising that there was an age in which what is self-evident to us today was not self-evident to us in previous ages. And his self-evident understanding became the issue of comprehensive education. He became passionate about comprehensive education. Why? Because he believed in equity and equality. That's a really interesting life story. And when I did this keynote, I said, look, Harry was brilliant at spotting gaps in hedges. He had to during the war. My goodness me, he'd better find the gap in the hedge and get through it. After the war, in his professional life, he saw it as a challenge to find new ways of doing things, whatever the circumstances. Whether those circumstances are good or adverse, he was looking for gaps in hedges. That's what his business was. I would give an example at the moment of, I don't know, there'll be people in here who, are, who come from academies, there'll be people in here who fiercely don't like academies. Uh, I am in the position of being a governor, probably more in the second camp than the first camp, regretting the disappearance of local democratic accountability, worrying about central uh, democratic uh, accountability becoming over mighty in England with 47 million people, which is very different from Scotland, you know, with, with 5 million, etc., etc. Uh, so I'm worried about all that, and I suppose, as, an, uh, as a governor in a, an, an academy, one of the things that I'm finding it difficult to recruit teachers, because you don't need reminding of all the adverse circumstances we're in, one of the things we're debating at the moment is how we're a private company because uh, that's what we are. Um, why on earth don't we use that bit of land there or some other bits of land to create some key worker housing? Uh, because we're a private company and we could do that and we could get our young people and it would be an interesting thing to get us to do. I would call that finding a gap in the hedge because if you did that, 
they wouldn't be able to have the right to buy because it's a private operation, etc., etc. And it would be worth testing what was possible. I think there are all sorts of things which you could test out. And in adverse circumstances, that becomes crucial. We're also talking at the local secondary school or making sure, and I noticed that was in the paper the other week, but we've been working on it, which is getting year 12 and year 13 youngsters who are thinking of making a career in teaching and giving them a bursary and involving them in education during years 12 and 13, because we think that's going to help. And by the way, Michael Goh's decision to abandon the duty is going to exacerbate our shortage of teachers. So I want you now, because otherwise it's all going to be hopeless, you've got to learn from each other. The expertise is up here, but it isn't here. Could you just quickly introduce yourself? You've probably come hunting in pairs, as everybody does. Um, but, but, but because that's the wise thing to do. It's one of the things we all do. Could you just quickly introduce yourself to somebody you don't know close to you uh, and say, have you thought of a gap in the hedge and what you might do?